Yo, yo. Yo, what's up, man? Hey, I like How your background. You? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. You're, you're styling. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to, man. It's It actually started because when I was uh, living in Tennessee, I was doing a lot of these in my car. And so I'd be like interviewing uh, whoever, some pro cyclist. And I'm like, this looks so bootleg. I need to like fix this. I, I, I put it up. Those. They're pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Lawrence Tendam was like, oh, wow. I didn't realize this was like so pro. I'm like, it's not. I'm in the McDonald's parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> they have the best Wi Fi like all over America, too. Dude, flying. Like, I, it was like 200 meg download. And I was like, this is clearly good enough for Zoom. I was, yeah. It's been uh, an adventure. So, yeah. It's man. great. It's great to meet you uh, via video. and Yeah, likewise, dude. Appreciate your comments and uh, especially in the Discord, which is, I was going to say this is how this started. So I just was looking back uh, at the beginning of the conversation. It was really on Strava. And um, so before we get into that, um, I pretty much just keep this rolling from the gun. Cool. And uh, we can catch up more afterwards of just like, in actual what's up but yeah yeah let's let's jump in so the first question is always people say the hardest but who is matt bickford um let's see i'm i'm a strength conditioning coach i guess professionally um i am uh i guess i'm a newer i'm a newer older cyclist if that makes sense um because yeah let's hit the cycling it's uh i was basically riding bikes when i was a kid um, mountain bikes, we had, you know, I have like three, I guess you'd call them like Fondo uncles. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always like, you know, getting hand-me-down bikes and riding with them. Um, and now that I'm an adult, I was like, man, I should have done more than that when I was a kid. But, you know, you get sucked into, you know, playing basketball and playing baseball and endurance sports are never like the cool sports when you're a kid. But, uh, you know, I was in a family where when I, every day I didn't have basketball practice, my older sister was on a swim team. And so it was like, oh, you don't have practice today. Get your ass to swim practice. Um, so we were kind of like always doing the endurance sports and um, stopped, uh, stopped playing team sports in high school because I had uh, some chronic like shoulder issues. Oh, um, nice. So like dislocations and stuff. Okay. So uh, that sent me down the uh, physical therapy wormhole. And then I was basically doing physical therapy and just running because there wasn't anything else to do. I was like, what do I do? You know, yeah. I can't play basketball. Um, and so physical therapy just turned into lifting weights. Uh, running turned into just thinking about training constantly, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm, you know, 18 and trying to think about how I can get stronger and how I could run faster. It's like obsessive and probably not even that healthy, you know, <laughs> but you know, what? It, to, to make you feel better about that, I wish I had had that mindset of like, I was playing volleyball and basketball, hated the conditioning aspect of it, truly right, believed right. in it. Like my volleyball coach was way, like, it was half the skill of the game. And the other half, like you're doing plyo, we wore jump soles. We did like the jump soles. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, I came out of volleyball fit. And yeah. then basketball, it was just you run up and down the court, but it's you know different. There was no endurance work, there was no strength right. work. I want to go back and be like, coach, why didn't you have us in the gym lifting for yeah. 30 minutes? Like, just it, give us the basics. It's much more common now, though. Like, yeah, I was, it is. I was just talking to my buddy, he coaches like high school lacrosse, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, with high school sports, it's most kids, you're just going to get them in season, mm -hmm. you know, and even if you're like a pretty good, you know, high school basketball player, you're playing in season, you might have some AAU things going on. Um, but even with his lacrosse team, they got him doing like really basic strength stuff, like twice a week in the off season, you know, and it's, it's not anything that's like, can be super meaningful, because you can't do it year round, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you can kind of like plant the seed, you know, and like get people working on it, and get people thinking about it. And I think that's a product of the internet. Cause it's like back in the day, like just, I'm sure cycling was the same way. It's like, you didn't have access to all this info. You're just going on, you know, oh. who know, you know? Yeah. I mean, my first training plan from a guy was a guy that was starting to mentor me and it was, uh, he actually, he was a graphic designer. So he made it into a PDF. So it looked super legit Slick. and he, uh, <laughs> 
yeah. And then once I had a real coach, we were emailing power files and yeah, dude. it was, yeah, just very funny. But I wish there was a guy in college, there was a buddy of mine and he's like, dude, I wish you would come to the gym with me because with your frame, I could get you jacked. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, that sounds fun. I was like, I would be a tight, like if I had to play football, I'd be a tight end pretty quick, right, right. you know, six, five, just, I need 50 oh, yeah. And, uh, we went a few times and I just, the, and I think this is with the cyclists. Like I just couldn't get a groove. And I was just like, we're, we're like, why are we waiting here? And he's like, well, you have to rest in between this. And I didn't, I just didn't know of what I was doing. There was no like pathway. Yeah, totally. And so I was just like, eh, I'm good with this. I mean, yeah, totally. people were like happy hour. Let's go do that instead. Yeah. <laughs> Bad choice. Well, you know, it's, I think a lot of the stuff, this could be, you know, this could be training. It just could be sports. It could be social stuff. Like we're more of a product of like the opportunities that we get. Like you were probably self-selected into playing volleyball and basketball because you're trying to figure out your social things and you're a kid and you're like, Hey, you big tall guy with long arms, come over here. And you're like, great. This is how I can get some social approval, you know? Right. In yeah. college, you know, when we should have been training or riding bikes, it's like you're probably out crushing beers because you're like, if I go train by myself, that sounds kind of fun, but it's not it's not a social thing, you know? Yeah. And that's why I always wonder if, uh, if I had cycled when I was in college. Like, I love the going off on your own. And I was in Boston, get out into like Massachusetts, you know, yeah, uh, out of the city. I think that would have been – it would have been a really interesting – interesting path in college having both like going and having your own time and then coming back to the dorm where it's just mayhem 24 right. seven. Um, did you, did you go to a school that had a collegiate team? I went to Boston college. I don't know if they do actually like I've never, or they're not good. No offense, BC. I've never <laughs> heard of anyone riding for BC. It's probably like a club or something. It's you know? probably a club. It's, yeah. it's tricky up there in, in Boston because it's like you're frozen for like the whole school year, you know? And that, that was the thing. That's why I'm actually not in New York anymore. It was finally had moved to Tennessee. Now I'm in North Carolina. Um, and part of the time in Florida, just because I'm super trying to get away from any cold weather. It, it had yeah. really, it rocked me the last couple of years I was there. I just couldn't, there's four good months and then it's yeah. just bad. It's a mega bummer. I think that's why I could never leave California. It's just like cold days are like 45 and hot days are like 70, you know? And it's like, yeah, it's 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 the gray in the Northeast, especially in Rochester. Kodak used to be headquartered there. So it was nicknamed the natural dark room because it's 270 overcast (laughs) days a year. You can go two weeks without seeing the sun. And it is so sad. And now when there's a day, I'm like, I'm grumpy today. And I'm like, Oh, it's it's gray and cloudy. (laughs) And yeah. Ro- Rochester's like, that's like right on the lake, right? Like, like Canada. Lake, yeah. Lake. Yeah. So what hard, hard pass, dude. Hard pass. Dude, people here when they're like, you know, I'll be in Florida and it's 55 people are in full weather gear. And we used to say 20 <laughs> was our 20 on the thermometer was our low, but you know, there's wind chill, whatever. It was so dumb. If you flatted, cause back then no one was riding, you didn't ride carbon wheels up there. Everyone had aluminum or whatever it is. And, yeah. uh, that was freezing. You took your gloves off and you started messing with a flat. There was a good chance your hands were going to be frozen. And it just, Ooh. just thinking about it, I'm like, what was I? I mean, I don't know. I was 27, 28, had different motivation than I guess, but it's just, yeah. you couldn't pay me to I'm do not, it now. I'm not gnarly enough for that, man. If it's, if it's under 40, I'm freezing my ass off. Yeah. It's, you I'm adapt, you adapt. But it's, you went, man. <laughs> uh, so one of the biggest questions, super big picture is, and then we're gonna, we'll kind of jump into some of the questions from the Discord, some of the ones I yeah, sent yeah. you. And this is one that I that I go back and forth on a little bit. Do you think cyclists should lift specifically for cycling or to be a strong overall human? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I like it because it, it kind of uh, it, it encapsulates some of like the conflicting motivations for, you know, adult recreational athletes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the answer is both, to be honest. Okay. Um, Anytime I frame recommendations, especially for athletes, it's like you, you have to meet the bare minimum of like the straight up physical activity guidelines for Americans, Mm -hmm. um, which is published every year. And that is, you know, it's the super basic American college of sports medicine, like 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week, you know, 
and cyclists go, well, that's, that's a ride. I'm yeah. cool. On that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but with that is, uh, lifting, engaging in resistance training twice a week, you know, because okay. people generally will have, um, you know, successful aging, better blood markers, you know, uh, lower body fat, you know, more muscle mass, all the good stuff that comes with normal health benefits of resistance training. And so for me, when I frame lifting for athletes, even recreational athletes, it's like, that should be the floor. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it goes the other way. Like I coach, um, you know, powerlifting and Olympic weightlifters too. And so they say, well, I'm just trying to snatch and clean and jerk as much as possible. I don't need to do any aerobic exercise. And it's like, you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how, well, how can I get you to get in there and get like 150 minutes a week? You know, for them, it could be walking, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's, that's kind of the floor and that's the way I like to frame stuff in general. Um, why do they need to do that? Is that, is that for the benefits of why we do endurance stuff for like mitochondrial density and yep. just becoming more efficient at everything aerobic and that will help them lift. 100%. Okay. So if the, uh, a lot like with endurance training, um, long-term to be super successful in strength sports, your, your volume needs to gradually go up over the course of your training career, right? You know, you might start off with doing a little bit, but you know, the farthest end of the spectrum, let's say someone's in like their third Olympic quad, right? They're doing like 12 lifting sessions a week. They're doing double days and, you know, that volume has to go up over time. And if your aerobic system is just shit, yeah. you're not going to be able to recover from the session as well. And you're probably just not really going to be that healthy in general. So, okay. um, so it's basically like, if we look at maybe like an ultra endurance athlete and someone who's just trying to clean and jerk, they're way opposite ends of the spectrum performance wise, mm -hmm. as far as athletes are concerned, this person will need to do the minimum aerobic work. And this person will need to do, you know, closer to the minimum of resistance training. work. Okay. So if you look at that, like a continuum, it can kind of answer some questions as to where, as to like what sort of dose an athlete would need. Mm -hmm. um, but with that, I mean, yeah. Cycling, you would need to do, you would need to have a good amount of specificity in the gym. Um, nothing super crazy because the, um, the cyclists will be in general be limited by their training resources for how much gym time they can do. Right. So like, if you're knocking out 20 hours a week, how much time can you really spend in the gym? You know, mm -hmm. even just for time, but also just for like recovery resources, you know, mm -hmm. like how many calories can you devote to the gym? Like mm -hmm. not too many, you know? Um, I have like 50 questions that stem off that statement. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We'll get it. We'll get it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so th the cyclists will end up training more like um, what, what I would consider like a beginner or a novice lifter for more of their training career. Um, this would also be very similar to like how you would train youth athletes. Right. But okay. a cyclist will just kind of get stuck in that cycle and that's okay. Cause you know, you don't need to be like squatting 405, you know, to be a good cyclist. You just need to be consistently working on that kind of uh, that force production. So hallmarks of that are going to be single leg work and having a, a wide variety of exercises, basically. God, my brain is like exploding right now. So you <laughs> hit on a couple of things. So then when you're talking about the, well, the unilateral, bilateral, we'll get to that. Um, yeah. yeah. We started this conversation with a post that I had put on Strava and you would just mention like, Hey, this is really interesting. Um, you are recommending lifting to failure, which for everybody that doesn't know the program that we had been using was GZ CLP. It's basically linear progression, five by three, six to two. We won't beat it to death. Everybody can go look it up if they're not familiar with it. And this is what started in the Discord, a freaking amazing conversation. If you are listening and you're not in the Discord, join. I'll put the <laughs> link in there. And then go to the top of the strength uh, and lifting one and just read through it. And then people were like, dude, this is awesome. I'm like, I'm going to podcast with this guy because I have to pick his brain. <laughs> you mentioned, yeah, force, you mentioned force production. And so what, like, this is going to be a, like a uh basic biology question, I guess, like when we are lifting, we're damaging the muscle and our body repairs it and we come back stronger. Correct. Right. Like super uh, basic. Yeah. That's, that's a part of it. Yeah. But what is, ha what happens if we're lifting, I go to the gym and I mean, you do have to increase the weight, but what happens when you get to a point when you're like, you had mentioned force 
progression or force production? Like, how do you know how much force you have to do to, to actually continually make gains? Cause other times you would make the comment too of like, Hey, you might go to the gym and 200 pounds feels a lot heavier on day, whatever, versus when you were there three days right. ago. What's, I mean, I guess I'm like opening up a wormhole, but, um, but maybe we should talk about like training to failure versus doing rate of perceived exertion or yeah. where, where should we take this? Let me here. Let me, let me, let me set this up in a certain way. This is one of the things that I've actually changed my mind on over the last like 10 years of training. Previously, I, I like coached, I like straight up coached the starting strength method. And I, you guys are like kind of familiar with that a little bit. It's hard to miss it in the internet age. Yeah. There were some people that knew it. I actually had never heard of it. It's uh, this guy wrote a book and he outlined maybe like a three by five sort of routine. It got super popular. He sold a bunch of copies, but it, it's a real like. Here, I have a copy of it here. Um, where are we at here? This book. Have you seen this book on Amazon? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it, it's very old school, and uh, you know, it's it's real simple, and that's how I trained the first time I started training. Okay. Um, and a lot of these kind of like linear progressions, five by five things, they kind of stem from that in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, I've changed my mind on that quite a bit um, because they all the linear progressions operate under this pretense where um, you need to kind of constantly overload the athlete or the lifter or trainee or whatever you want to call them mm -hmm. uh, in order to drive progression where overloading drives progression. Whereas, um, and this is more similar to how we train endurance athletes is I'm more convinced that, um, creating the proper training environment allows an athlete to get stronger and then getting stronger as an expression of that. So like take endurance riding, for instance, right? If you ran, if, let's say you did like a four hour ride last weekend, you wouldn't go, okay, maybe I average 250. I need to average 255 next week. Otherwise my program's not working. Right. No, you just got to go and kind of soak up the training at the proper intensities. And then those increases in fitness will happen when they happen, you know, mm -hmm. but creating that really good training environment and the correct amount of dose every week, that's what creates adaptations as opposed to, Hey, we need to overload this person. How are we overloading? How are we overloading? So, so it's, with the linear progressions, it's like, I know these guys are doing this. This is basically just like a different paradigm from what you were doing with the resistance training. Yeah. Does, does that sort of, does, did you see this? So there's like a base period to lifting, like this general preparation period where I have athletes who we talk and say, like, okay, November through let's say February, it's a lot of endurance miles. It's some tempo. It's not sexy. It's riding. It's going in the gym and we're going to figure out better recommendations from this conversation. But, and everybody buys into that because we understand like, okay, I'm slowly building up my aerobic abilities over time. We're not going harder. We're just right. putting in the time. Right. So is that, so a, is that a good analogy? Yeah, I think so. We're, you know, in the middle of like, so let's say you're doing like a base period, you might be riding some tempo, but the most of your TSS is coming from just doing endurance rides, right? Mm -hmm. You may be like working out some duration on tempo or, or however yeah. you use yeah, yeah. Um, The concern wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to get better because I'm not overloading myself right now. It's kind of just like, no, hang out. We're just going to be doing slowly doing a little more like the power will come in the future after you kind of soak this up. And that's I really think, good to hear, man. Cause I'm, you know, <laughs> but I think, I think resistance training is more similar to that than people think, you know, where the, the bias for most newer trainees and, and a lot of coaches too, is session to session. It's like, okay. How can I improve this session to session? I need to see a progression session to session mm -hmm. in order for there to be progress. But when you zoom out and look at someone's, uh, you know, progress over a decade, if the rate was really, I'm going to add five pounds a week. That's not how it happens in, in vivo, you know, like <laughs> ever thought about I, that. Like what I'd be these... lifting a thousand pounds, you know yeah. what I mean? So, I mean, that'd be dope, but <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's not the case. So all, all discussions of resistance training, like, especially if you're using this as a supplement that you're layering on top of endurance training needs to be kept in mind that, you know, it's uh we're, the goal is to create the correct amount of uh, stress, 
the dose needs to be correct. The environment needs to be correct for recovery to be good. Um, and then progressions are a product of, uh, you know, a proper training environment and proper recovery, as opposed to being a forced overload that drives an adaptation. And it's, it's a little funky, but you know, no, I, I, it's a good explanation of it. Like it, I've never really training works though, you know, sorry, say that last part again. That, that's how endurance training works. Though, yeah. Right? So what made you switch when, what was the light bulb moment where like, wait a minute, this linear progression, like I got to progress an athlete that's working with me every session doesn't make sense. Like what, what did you read a different book? Was there something that like you had an incident with an athlete or what kind of made you start thinking more critically about this? Yeah. Um, it was a lot of conversations with a lot of different people. Um, mm -hmm. and it was just experimenting and trying new stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially after running through, you know, dozens of people through like a linear progression style thing and then watching them, okay, we're going to reset. Now we're going to do it again and blah, blah, blah. Um, just seeing that, okay, what's actually taking place here? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so it was a lot of conversations, a lot of zooming out. I, this isn't like a unique thought on my part, um, but it's definitely like a different camp. Okay. Um, and I basically, as opposed to using weights prescriptively, I started using RPE prescriptively. Um, like those still correlate to percentages, right? Um, so, but as a, you know, but if you're just going in and adding weight every single time, you know, you end up using RPE anyway, because the first thing you say is, hey, how hard was that? You're like, mm -hmm. pretty hard, man. <laughs> okay, cool. Like, let's 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 give us some vocab so we can stick like make that a little more accurate you know so speaking of vocab if people are looking up linear progression is there a name for the camp that is more rpe based uh i don't think so i mean okay. you no know, it's just kind of um there's been a lot of good literature written about rpe based training um people have been doing it with endurance training like before it power meters or heart rates it's just mm -hmm. is that was that easy medium or hard you know mm -hmm. like the old three zone system. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff. There's a bunch of people whose like entire uh, uh, like research jam is doing studying RPE. There's so much good stuff out there. Um, That's cool. So. What, so what does the athlete do then when I had actually posted this in the discord, I was like, okay, so this sounds stupid typing this out right now, but how do you approach it when I guess this would only be if you're on a linear thing, you go to the gym, you're supposed to lift X pounds today and it feels heavy and you're like, I got to lift this. I think a lot of us, we don't want to take weight off because last week we did this and yeah. ignore the fact that we just did a 15 hour week. I got to lift this. And that's, you know, great recipe for injury. Great recipe for just screwing your body up. Right. Just take the weight off or is it take the day? Like you shouldn't be in the gym or, or do you ever have somebody flip into like a uh, low weight, high rep? Um, kind of yeah, good question. That? Um, it's not a problem I have anymore because I use RPE prescriptively. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just coming off as like a big shill for auto regulation. <laughs> um, but think of, so let's, let's bring it back to cycling, right? Yeah. Um, let's say you're doing, uh, it's an easy example. Let's say you're doing five by fives, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and let's say an athlete was supposed to do 400, right? Mm-hmm. And they're absolutely smoked doing 360, you know, but mm -hmm. maybe it's like, you know, their effort is right where it should be. And they're popping out three, 360 or so. You'd probably just say, Hey, let's knock them out. Just, just keep doing it. Let your power fall. You know, as long yeah. as you're not like riding tempo when you should be yeah. doing it. You I'm in that camp. I'm in that yeah. camp. Just, so it's, you're already committed. You're into the workout. Just fin crank it out. Exactly. And so lifting is the, the same way, especially with you're dealing with endurance athletes, because the stress of someone's, you know, let, let's say even if you're just like a cat three and you're riding for 12 hours a week, right? The stress of your endurance training is going to be up and down, up and down, up and down. Mm -hmm. So the idea that your lifting can just be totally straight and predictable. Mm -hmm. Nice try, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so for the most part, doing really simple, hey, I feel great today. I'm going to move the weights up five or 10 pounds more than I thought I was going to. I don't feel awesome today. I'm going to move them down 10, 20 pounds. Um, that really smooth things out because in all programs, uh, we use, you know, explicit weights and percentages like 
as a representation of what the stress of that training is going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's just a guess. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so if I say, Hey, I want you lifting 75%, that might not be the right stress for the day. Maybe you need to do a little more Mm -hmm. or maybe you need to do a little bit less. So I think just having a layer of um, knowing like what's the intent of the sets and reps today, and then having a system for being able to tweak it. um, It really smoothed things out, you know, what are good sets and reps? You hear everything from strong, strong lifts, five by five, or we yeah. got GZPLP, we got five, three, one. So, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of, and is this, is that like, dude, that's like asking what's the threshold rep for today? Like how many right. minutes? Yeah. 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 It's kind of like, uh, that's kind of like asking like, what does a block of training look like? You know, yeah. <laughs> This is why this is why this, like, is, this is the best thing is that Patrick Wally's brother one time he said to me, I think it was him, he was like, You just gotta remember, dude, lifting is a sport on its own. Like totally. totally. We are, I don't even think we're not even really cat five, are we? We're like grand fondo. No offense, grand fondos, I love you. We're just we're not even racing. We're like yeah, jumping in the gym and totally, totally. Um yeah, lifting is a sport. It's uh it's it's its own discipline. Um, this is, this is, again, this is why we got to bang out a template. Um, I'll, I can just drum some stuff up and send it to you, right? Cause it'll give us, it'll give us, um, it'll give us, a, it'll give us like a touch point about what things look like. That would um, be huge because especially when you had made the comment, what's the goal of the session? <laughs> I've never thought about lifting sessions the way I do cycling. Right. Right. Endurance ride, go ride endurance. Like it's going to get hard at three hours. Keep pedaling. Don't go harder. Yeah. Try not to go easier, make it home and don't feel totally smashed. Right. You know, I'm, lifting has just been like, okay, this is the day I go lift heavy stuff. Exactly. And so and here's the, here's a bottleneck for, I, I think I mentioned this a little bit, like um, here's a huge bottleneck where it's, I got into coaching lifting just because I wanted to stay involved in athletics. Right. Mm-hmm. But then most of my work ends up being with like 50% people doing barbell sports, another good chunk doing general fitness stuff. And then some people uh, I coach as like a supplement to their, whatever the sport they're doing, you know, maybe endurance stuff, maybe martial arts. Um, I worked at a university for a little bit and that was all we did was work with the college athletes. Right. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is like, these are the people that could potentially benefit from it the most, but the idea that you're going to have a good knowledge about, you know, one sports domain, and then also a really good knowledge about a supplement for that, mm-hmm. or even have like two coaches that communicate together. It's just like, it's not going to happen, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's a large area where like, you know, strength coaches and, you know, strength conditioning folks can have a large impact just getting stuff out there, you know? Mm-hmm. Cause like, think about how much you need to know just to program a good cycling block. Mm-hmm. It's so tricky, you know, once you're actually looking at it and actually care, you know? Yeah. Once um, you care, it's like just <laughs> the individual and who, yeah, where have they been? Where are they going? How long, just so many variables. And then that, that wonderful added piece that 95% of them have a life outside of it. So they're like, oh, I missed the last two days. Do I just, sh- do I just redo those? I'm like, nah, no, not really. We need to like rebake this cake yeah, a little bit. The same deal. Let's, let's talk some sets and reps though. Cause I think that's, that's kind of the meat and potatoes that people want, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and with that, I'll add on top your comment of, so people might be thinking like, okay, well, RPE, give me some starting points. You had made the comment of like 70 to 80% of someone's one rep max is where most of their lifting would be. Totally. Is that correct? Yeah. I think that's a good place to start. Um, it's uh again, to kind of like for our audience here, again, to bring it back to, um, to, to cycling, you know, like you probably want to accumulate most of your TSS between what, like 60 and 70%, you know, most of your TSS coming from endurance, right. Mm -hmm. Think about 70 to 80%, maybe as low as 65 of your one RM for uh, on a given lift. Think about that as kind of like your endurance sweet spot. Right. And that's where you're maxing out at. That's not, yeah. Up, but okay. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Lifting uh, totally it's, incorrectly. <laughs> it's wild, um, but yeah, it's like so the fatigue cost. Let's say you wanted to get all of your TSS from doing like threshold and above, and then maybe VOT max. Like, and then other than that, you're either like not riding or just maybe riding zone one or something. The you could do it, but the fatigue cost of that would be massive. You know, massive. you could be doing about half the riding and just feel smashed. 
So think about lifting in the same way, right? The closer you get to one single rep at RPE 10, like hardest you can fucking go, like this is everything I got, the, the less dose you're getting, but then also the more fatigue that is. So the big thing to think about is kind of that like stimulus to fatigue ratio of doing a lift. And again, it's the same for endurance. Right. Um, if you go too low, similar to cycling, like if you're just cruising at 50%, like all weekend, it's like, yeah, there's probably not a giant fatigue cost there, but maybe the stimulus isn't quite strong enough. Mm -hmm. So the same for lifting. I, I think the floor for most people, especially who aren't terribly concerned with the, um, the skill practice of really being able to grind out like super heavy singles as you would in like a barbell sport, um, you could probably go as low as like 65% and have really good, um, strength and force, uh, outputs. Um, so it's not uncommon that I'll have someone do maybe one single set above 80%, take a percentage of that, go back down and hit, and then get in the volume, maybe like four sets of four, you know, four sets of five at like 70% of their estimated one RM. So let's talk about that then. What's a simple, if we're going to start around 65%, what are the sets and reps that people would start with? And let's assume that for someone that's li listening that has not lifted before, and maybe we could we can chat on this or whatever, like going through an adaptation period where they're like doing mm -hmm. body weight squats and doing just the bar. Do you recommend that for like eight weeks, six weeks? Yeah. I probably actually wouldn't recommend it at all. Really? Um, yeah. So here's the deal is that the minute you're adding load, you're kind of changing the lift. Um, and so you can, you can body weight squat the house down, right? You could be doing goblet squats, like holding your backpack. Um, but I don't know if that's actually going to prepare you for the skill practice of like lifting with a barbell. Um, it might be okay. There's some stuff you can do to make it harder. Like you could do split squats, you could do single leg work. Um, but then it's just, I, I mean, you can load people up the same day um, if they're comfortable with it. Um, Cause it's a skill in itself. So I'd rather have someone, you know, squat the bar, let's add a little more, um, use dumbbells, find a kettlebell, whatever you can do there. Um, I guess so realistically, like start with the bar and then add 15 totally. pounds, 20 totally. pounds. Like, cause I, my brain is like, okay, you got to do adaptation. Then you start with the bar and add like 70. And then it's like, right. okay, that's too, too much. You're already screwing up the whole process. Right. Uh, you could do that. Um, I know in a lot of like super classic periodization uh, models, they'll have like a mechanical adaptation phase, um, you know, but for the most part, like, especially with uh, cyclists where, Hey, you don't have that much gym time like this annually, like we got to get you rolling, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's another case for using RPE. We say, okay, Hey, Brandon, we're going to lift today. We're going to do some squats and I don't know, overhead press and, pull-ups just as an example say all right so let's let's get warmed up and then let's grab an empty bar and hey let's work slowly up and i want you to find a set of four where you could have done four more reps well so that would be a four at rpe six so we can just use rp and reps in reserve kind of as a proxy here right wherever you end up for the day it's four at six so your four at six is going to be the same stress as my four at six which might be more than yours and that's totally fine i don't think anyone needs to be uh, physically prepped for working up to a four at six. Um, and then say, Hey, this week, let's go up to four at seven, you know, mm -hmm. and then maybe you can sprinkle in some back off work. And this know? is four sets of four or I'm just, I'm just saying using one set of four as an example. So just four reps. Right. Got it. So really common, uh, way I do this with new lifters let's, uh, is you can do, um, just as an example, you can do three sets of four, the first set you can do to RPE six, add a little more weight, set of four at RPE seven, add a little more weight, four at RPE eight. So what that does is it kind of gets you a little bit tired for that last set, right? Mm -hmm. um, that will keep the weight a little bit lower mm -hmm. right, for cyclists. Still get mm -hmm. the stress in, but absolute weight a little lower. And they can also teach you to kind of like compare, um, compare sets. So you can kind of work on your, your internal, uh, uh, your internal measure there. Um, this is a good skill for everyone. And it's a good skill for cyclists too. Cause that's like the biggest thing they talk about when the, everyone just started training off power, right? You, you, it's hard to gauge your efforts. Cause if you're just staring at your 
staring at your Wahoo, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how hard is that? I don't know. I was just staring at it, you know? Dude, that is such a good analogy. Oh, man, I love that. It's useful, man. It's useful. This is really reforming how I look at lifting. Um, hmm. This is cool. So, so starting point then would be do stuff with the bar. How many lifts do you think someone should do in a workout? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so for most people, I think somewhere in like the four to six, uh, four to six different lifts, I think is good. Um, I think the, one of the big mistakes that, um, resistance training for like endurance resistance training programs make is they try to make it look too much like their sport. Right. Cause I'm sure you've seen programs where it's like, Oh, we're doing three sets of 15 on eight different exercises in one session. You know, mm-hmm. um, I like a smaller pool of exercises using, you know, compound lifts, you know, things like, you know, squatting, single leg lifts, you know, pushing and pulling for upper body. Um, and then maybe doing uh, trunk or core at the end there. So I think for the most part, um, you know, anywhere from four to six lifts in one session, I think is pretty decent. Uh, I think you can get away with doing three or four for most people. Um, Cause I know, you know, endurance athletes are trying to spend as little time in there as possible. Um, but yeah, I would, I would do, you know, four to six is a good starting point. I would always start with the most important lift of the day mm-hmm. or maybe the heaviest absolute lift. So mm-hmm. it would be you know, some sort of bilateral squatting variation, some sort of bilateral hinging or deadlift variation, and then kind of work down towards lifts that are less important. So you could do, let's say you deadlift, do a single leg squat, um, maybe some hinging, like an RDL or something like that. And then maybe at the end in a circuit fashion for a cyclist, you could do maybe pair like, you know, one, one push and one pull, you know, on mm-hmm. a time, something like that. that. That would just be like a really, really brief example. When do you think they should choose unilateral versus bilateral? Uh, like, does it matter? Some people say like unilateral, like it just takes so long. I have to do both legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I actually hate that. <laughs> hey, what? I, I do in both legs. I've been doing uh in like for my program, for example, right now I'm doing on uh, Wednesdays, I'm doing like a reverse lunge mm-hmm. and then Fridays I'm doing, um, like rear foot elevated split squats after okay. 10 minutes. And that's the biggest pain in the ass. Cause I do one set it. 12 and then I'm gassed and it's like, Oh shit, I got to do my left leg. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I would have people do both year round basically. Okay. Um, so, but every session, like throw in something that's unilateral. Yeah. For the most part, I think as long as you're getting it on a weekly basis, you're probably all right. Um, you know, I think, uh, I don't think exercise selection matters a whole lot just because the gym work is so far removed from your, your sport work, right? Like let's say you're deadlifting for a set of five. Mm -hmm. How similar is that to riding a bike for three hours? Like, mm, I think it's important, but I I think it's so far away. And the farther away that is from your specific sport activity, kind of the less important that exercise selection becomes. Interesting. Um, yeah. With that in mind, I think uh, single leg work is important because you're creating force on one leg like you do on your bike, right? Um, so I, I'd probably get it in on most sessions and probably yeah. have a pretty good balance between uh, unilateral work and bilateral work. I think that's my biggest problem is um, there's so many variations and it's like, oh, well, I didn't do that one. And I haven't done the skater lunge and I haven't I it's gotta hit huge, this. There's so much stuff out there, you know. There's so much stuff. Well, you're like, don't look at our light workouts that I put together because there's like 15. <laughs> there's yeah, like but- a workouts for a warm up, and then you can do the. Then it's like four legs, two upper body, some band yeah. work, yeah. and it takes like an hour. It's a good hour, yeah. but probably keeps, you, probably keeps you moving the whole time too. For the most, it was like the big lifts, and then that was all of like the secondary. So I would probably end up doing. And that, that's just for like adaptation. So what we were doing like the first eight weeks when I was doing uh, normal lifts, like lifting heavy, it would be probably, probably six or seven. And I always felt like I was leaving something behind, but it was just like 50 yeah. minutes. I'm like, dude, don't sit in the gym all day. Like 
Cause <laughs> yeah. you got the heavy stuff done, just keep on moving. But yeah, yeah definitely I, overthinking I that. that. Uh, if you're doing, so like, if you kind of, you know, if you can break, you break lifts down into buckets, right? The, the most common buckets we have here are, you know, with lower body, there's basically like squatting, right? So knee dominant lifts mm -hmm. and then hinging. So like hip dominant lifts, so like hip extension and knee extension dominant lifts. Um, and then upper body, it's basically like you got, you can push vertically, push, or oh, sorry, push horizontally, yeah. push vertically, pull vertically, pull horizontally. And if you do those, you're pretty much training everything, you know, okay. um, there needs to be some sort of cutoff point of what's good enough. And so right. for me, it's like, you know, if we're just, you know, I've limited time with an athlete every week, we're going to do some kind of squatting, some kind of deadlifting. Um, and we're going to do some single leg work. And one of those can be kind of more posterior chain dominant. And one of them could be a little bit more knee extension dominant. And if you do that, you're good, you know, mm -hmm. like you're kind of getting it done. You're checking all the boxes there. Okay. Um, so if you're lifting three times a week, then you could split it up a little bit more maybe have a deadlift day. Well, and then just like a lighter, maybe a, well, so this is going to be my question. Actually, I'm going to go off that question. So we're always doing RPE is what your recommendation would be. So it's never like, yeah, I'm trying to think how I would put this into words. Like, so would you squat if you were in the gym three times a week during the winter, when you're far away from competition, would you squat and deadlift every all three days? Yeah. Um, I think that could be an approach that you could use. Um, you, I would also encourage people to use exercise selection and variation um, as a means of fatigue management, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say, let's get two deadlift variations. Um, let's say one day you are doing um, just a regular deadlift from the floor, just like conventional deadlift, you know, however, however works. bar. Yeah. Trap bar. Sure. Let's say one day you're doing trap bars, maybe from the high handle. So it's like a little heavier. Um, and let's say another day you were doing an RDL, right. And just to keep it simple, let's say, um, both of those days, let's say you deadlift on Fridays, let's say you RDL on Mondays, right. Mm -hmm. Maybe do some squatting on Wednesday or something. Um, let's say both of those, you work up to a set of eight, like eight or nine RPE. So like pretty hard, you know, and for like a set of eight, like that's a good set. Um, the, the weight you're going to use on a trap bar deadlift from an absolute perspective is going to be way higher than on an RDL. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the relative intensity is going to be about the same. It's going to be eight at eight. Um, so you can use variations like that as a means of fatigue management. Right. So as opposed to just saying, Hey, let's go do trap bar deadlifts at like 70% of what you did on Friday let's do another variation. Right. So it'll still be challenging. Right. You still might get some, a little bit of local fatigue, um, a little bit more overload. Right. Um, you get to add in some skill practice. Um, but at the end of the day, you lifted a lighter weight. So this total stress of that training session from that specific exercise, it's going to, it's going to be a lot lower. Um, so with RPE, definitely using variation in there to control stress as well. And then use variation on like, so if, you know, that was the primary lift, the deadlift on both of those days, the squat might not be a normal heavy RPE eight squat. It's going to be like a goblet squat or a, okay. 100%, 100%. He's, ra he's raising the roof. If you're not watching this, if you're listening to this. hundred percent. So like, yeah, if you do like, let's say, you know, in season or directly preseason, let's say you got two sessions Maybe you do heavy squat one day, heavier deadlift one day. Maybe you're doing like sets of threes and fours and it's, you know, decently challenging. Mm -hmm. The lifts after that, you could either do, hey, let's do, you know, let's do good mornings. Let's do RDLs after that heavy squat. Let's do a single leg variation. Maybe mm -hmm. we're doing lunges after that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so you can kind of like pick a child lift or the parent lift and, and stack it on there. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but that's, that's one way to do it, you know, and I think... Um, the benefits of, of using a larger pool of exercises um, that are close to the parent lifts, um, it's super good skill practice, right? Um, which is kind of what you'd want to see from, uh, you know, newer lifters, youth lifters, someone who's going to be coming back after layoffs, you know, maybe you had an early season, maybe you're lifting 
fell off at the end of the season. Great. Let's start back at square one. She's a large pool of exercises for that kind of long-term development. Okay. So a lot of variety. Yeah. A good amount of variety. Um, it's a balance though. Cause like you want to be able to be exposed to a lift enough in order to get good at it mm -hmm. and like get used to it and get those adaptations. Mm -hmm. Um, but enough, a large enough pool of exercises where you're, you know, challenged and have to learn, learn new skills. Right. Okay. So then as we get into the season and we're lowering, whether the, uh, fatigue management, I like that term. If we're, lowering the amount of weight or we're, we're reducing the number of sessions that we do. Do you think we should still be looking at similar RPEs as in the preseason or is that, is there any place for low weight, high rep? Um, what do you kind of think about that? Yeah. Or so you're just asking about in season training in general. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people that's when it's like, okay, well now I'm racing. Do I still okay, lift? Right. And I say yes, but, and so see, I like, <laughs> RPE is good because I, it's so hard. I tell people, I'm like, number one, I'm not a strength coach. Number two, I have no meter of how you feel and what you're doing in the gym every day. Like what, how much, so I'm like, this is a lot on you. And I understand like that kind of sucks, but like, this is just where we're at. Like I, if I had a power meter and I could learn and I was a strength coach, I could help you in, right. you know, Scotland, but I'm not there. So it's like, so how does an athlete then shift into in season and are we going, what, what's the, and again, this is like, um, we're asking for a training plan, but what would be a high level recommendation maybe? Yeah, totally. It's, and it's super tricky because the only thing you can upload to training peaks is, is, is their words, you know, yeah. <laughs> and maybe a smiley face if you're lucky. Exactly. Um, so yeah. The, so the hallmarks of in season training um, pretty much for all, all, all sports, this includes endurance sports is you're really wanting to maintain the fitness that you made in the off season. Right. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that at endurance athletes goof up is that they, they lift in the preseason, maybe they lift in the base. Um, I was listening to another podcast. Uh, it will remain nameless um, where it's, Hey, we're going to lift for 10 weeks and then we're just going to stop. Mm. Cause you're good. You got all that. Now I think some of that thinking comes from, and this is a tangent to your question, but I think it's important to preface it. Some of this thinking comes from, you know, coaches reading studies and seeing like the one that Patrick posted where it's like people were doing four sets of four, three days a week, and it um, improved their power outputs and, um, you know, cycling economy. So people will read that and say, great, my athletes will do 12 weeks of lifting just like this study and we're going to get all the benefits. Mm -hmm. um, but with all training, there's a little bit of reversibility, right? So how, how long after from when you remove that stimulus um, do those performance characteristics like detrain? Like mm -hmm. how long does that degradation take? Mm -hmm. um, and maintenance doesn't really happen in vivo, right? Because if you just drop that stress way down, eventually it's going to peter off, right? So you're kind of trying to find that balance of, okay, how, how little training can I get away with? Uh, while keeping that reversibility at bay through the whole season. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that comes back to just like, uh, just like, you know, planning out anyone else's in season training. When's your a race? Uh, when are you peaking? Great. Let's work backwards. Mm -hmm. um, how long can we maintain these fitness adaptations for um, where we can say, Hey, we can drop the amount of lifting down to, down to this amount. Um, and that's going to be trial and error for a lot of people. Um, okay. But in general, what I would recommend, and this is like the super vanilla, like NSCA approach is just, you don't want to introduce new rep ranges in season. Um, DOMS, especially from gym training, usually that's going to be from things that are novel, right? Um, like I've been lifting for, I don't know, like 15 years um, and I'm pretty well trained, but I could probably go find some silly ass exercise and get stupid sore, right? <laughs> Like if I went and did like a set of 30 on hack squats, you know, yeah. I leave the gym the next day. Oh shit. I probably feel terrible when I go ride, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'd probably steer away from explicitly doing uh, super high rep work in season. Um, that might skew too far on the, um, you might just have to accumulate a lot of sets and reps and a lot of volume in order to get any sort of stimulus. So I didn't general like to see someone, uh, working, um, 
kind of like a medium wide uh, amount of rep ranges in season. Uh, I don't want it to be really similar to what they did in the off season because we're just layering on a stress there. And I don't want that to be fluctuating at all because the cycling is going to be fluctuating a lot um, and see how long they can hold that for, you know, 45 minutes, 50 minute sessions twice a week, real quick, just kind of get a good stimulus in and get out of there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's going to be different person to person, but I want it to look about the same. I just want like 40% less. Of 40% less of like maybe like total volume. Just got it. So when you talk about rep ranges, like people, how often are athletes supposed to switch up like rep ranges? Like, is that, I don't know anything about rep ranges. And I guess as we're talking about like lifting heavy, is this four to eight reps for every, like you should never do more. Is there a way to say that you should never don't go more than X reps? (laughs) Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, the, you know, for a cyclist, I would probably put most of their work in the, like the three to 10 rep range. Okay. Uh, so for me that the top end of that would be kind of like flirting with like the hypertrophy muscular endurance sort of range, um, staying clear of like straight up maximal strength, which isn't necessarily important in, in cycling. Um, so I, I'd want most of it to be relatively uh, moderate. Um, rep ranges need to, uh, kind of reflect like what sort of, what sort of strength they're trying to build. Right. So like strength is, it's going to be specific to like the amount of force, uh, velocity, um, and joint angles. Right. So joint angles that gets taken care of just by, you know, normal exercise selection. Um, if you go much heavier than that, so like doubles, singles, things that are pretty challenging, then you start training that high force, low speed sort of strength, right? And you know, when you're lifting and you get to the last rep and your bar speed starts to go super slow, right? Mm-hmm. For a cyclist, I would pretty much remove a program that used any of those reps too extensively. Um, it's just not the kind of force production and um, the strength that we're looking for. Um, and staying around that sort of like 70, 75% mark, um, you know, with maybe sets of like four to six, Mm-hmm. Your all your reps will pretty much have identical bar speed, which is what we're looking for there. So I think just as a rule of thumb, you know, four to maybe 10 reps per set, uh, depending on the, uh, depending on the exercise and RPE is in like the five to eight sort of range. So when you rack the weight, you say, you know, I could have done anywhere between two to five more reps, you know? So things should be looking pretty crispy, you know? Yeah. Like kind of no, no grinders is a good rule of thumb. Like where you're like, ah, is that a grinder? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's, so. yeah. I had a lot of those last year. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, don't get me wrong. I crumbled they're myself. They're fun, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it, and that's the thing. It's a different buzz than cycling and it hits you differently. It's just like a neuromuscular shred and you get home and like, Four hours later, it's like somebody hits you in the face with a pillow, and it's like, whoa, I'm going to take a nap because I can't it's keep fatiguing, my eyes open. Right. It's fatiguing. Super you know? fatiguing. Super fatiguing. One of the, um, I, we got, no, we got just a couple minutes left. I don't want to take up your whole uh, afternoon here. What's uh, basics for home? Do you think everybody needs to go to a gym if they really want to get stronger? Um, I think it can be a good tool. I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think it's like 100% necessary. Um, I want to really try to remove like the barrier of entry for people doing lifting. Right. Especially talking to endurance athletes, they all have a bunch of reasons why they can't get to the gym. Right. And so you kind of got to meet people where they're at, you know? So if someone says, Hey, I got some kettlebells, you know, I found these loaded dumbbells on Craigslist. Um, Great. You can have a pretty good program. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, You might have to, it might be a little bit more challenging because they'll have to be creative and they'll have to learn some more challenging variations. But um, I mean, I was working with people who were, you know, during, during COVID last year, and we were trying to do all sorts of creative stuff at home. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, if you have a kettlebell, you can, you can do step ups, you can do split squats, you can do lunges. Um, If you're changing the, if you don't have a ton of weight, you'll have to do some higher reps uh, in order to get to like a high enough RPE for it to be effective. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, split squats are hard and probably a kick-ass exercise for just about every cyclist. And Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take a lot of weight for those to get super challenging. So if that is the kind of equipment someone has, great, go for it. 
if they want to get a little more out of it, they should find a place with good plates and a good rack and barbells and plates and maybe a couple machines, you know? So, so the basics for a home gym would be like some kettlebells, some free weights, uh, maybe even if they have a trap bar and can get some plates that aren't crazy, yeah. like just as much stuff as you can get within your budget. And then when you're really ready to lift heavier, get to the gym and totally. I think uh, if you have space, I mean, I live in San Francisco, so no one has space. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you have space, you know, investing in some good strength and conditioning equipment doesn't go bad. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, like, just it's don't like plan you, to move anywhere. Don't move. <laughs> don't move. <laughs> it's uh, it's not like cycling stuff. You know, like your your group set's going to be working kind of crappy in about three years if you're really smashing the miles. But those plates are still going to weigh the same. You know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it's just, it, it can be helpful for a lot of people if you have it at home, you know. Dude, this was awesome. This was uh, any, we're at an hour. What's uh, anything that I missed or notes that you'd want to add? Of, you know, you'd throw around the word of a template. What's, how can people get in touch with you if they want to, do you work with people outside of San Francisco? Oh, yeah. Um, how can people get in year- touch with you if they want to? Yeah take their lift uh, to the next we, level this we year. Can just put my, I, I can send you my, my contacts. You can toss them in the show notes or something. That's okay. Easiest. Cool. Um, but yeah, this year, basically I pivoted like half my work to working with people remotely. Um, I was basically working downtown San Francisco doing like 75% of folks were in person. And now it's more like 75 or remote 25 in person. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just kind of, it's kind of different, you know, but it's a mm-hmm. part of it. You got to meet people where they're at, you know? Yeah. So I guess to encapsulate all this, to like make the conclusion, if someone's like, okay, wait, so now where do I start? They, they should write out their four to six workouts. And I think you, you nailed it with like, it's a squat or a deadlift. It's a knee based or a hinge upper body, push, push, pull, pull. Yeah. Um, start with RPE and start with, is it safe? You know, say you're going to do, what do you think of five by five? I always just thought that was easy to remember or like four <laughs> by six or like, something totally. like where should they just start? And then where do, how do they learn where to go besides getting a strength coach? Or is that just like, is there a, it's hard, right? Like it's, how does it's the, hard without getting overly prescriptive. Um, yeah. I think, um, I think a five by five can be fine. Um, uh, it's tricky. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is like, I'm like, uh, people are would... going to be like, Brendan, you hate templates and you're literally asking <laughs> for a template. But okay, here's, we, I talked about this a little bit on the Discord, but this would be the place for a template, right? So if you're expecting to like, hey, I'm going to get as many upgrade points as I can. I have this dank template, you know, like this is my ticket. You're like, yeah, mm, maybe, not. maybe not. But the farther away you are from your actual sport, right? Like if you're just, if this is a supplement, this is another layer you're going to put on top of your cycling training. Mm -hmm. If you can get 90% of the benefits out of a template and then also learn some skills about how to, uh, how to like change that template for what you have going on. Mm -hmm. then I think the template can get you there. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, if knowledge is really the bottleneck uh, and like the barrier of entry for people to start on a resistance training program, then yeah, whatever you got is great. You know, um, I think usually what I suggest that people do is say, Hey, whatever program you're doing or whatever you're comfortable with, um, in your notes, start tracking your RPEs, right? Just say after each set, just give it a little, you know, give it a little at symbol and say, okay, I could have done two more reps. Okay. At eight, at nine, you know, Ooh, that was a 10 at 10, you know, that was a warm up weight. Um, and I think that is, ends up being a really good tool in a lot of people's toolbox. Cause that's just a layer you can toss on any program you're already doing, you know? And you're making the good point of like, you're learning to lift without the power meter, right? Without yeah. the, get, become <laughs> one with the weights. And you know, as I was asking that question, like, okay, well, where do people start? It's like, well, the answer was RPE of five, RPE of six to seven to eight. And then I'm like, well, how do you know when to increase when that doesn't, when the RP doesn't feel like five? Exactly. Okay. exactly. See, this is really like a mind shift for me <laughs> of, yeah, it, this is, dude, this is a great conversation for myself of like being able to go into the gym, have a good workout on days when you are tired and you know yeah. that it doesn't have to be like 
Right. You know, the, the, there's a range of endurance. Some days it's X watts. Some days it's X minus 20 and that's still cool. Yeah. Yeah. Some days you're having to keep yourself from riding at 80% just because you're, you're just, yes. you're stuck, you know, and to your point of like, Hey, didn't feel heavy. There were days where I was like, I could have lifted more. That was the day to lift more and not the day when I'm tired and I'm trying to keep up with the lift. Yeah. So my last question then what's so five is I could have done 10 more of these and eight is like, okay, that was pretty tough. I had maybe like two more. Is that like yeah. RPE? Totally. So the simplest implementation is just thinking about a one to 10 scale mm -hmm. and just working backwards from 10 where 10 would be like, like no more reps in the tank. Nine would be one more rep in the tank. Eight would be two and then work. Perfect. Back. Okay. Um, anything lower than five. It's like, maybe if you're doing on a percentage work or it's something that's like, ex like, um, prescriptive, mm -hmm. um, but I usually don't, it's hard to figure out what a four is, you know what I mean? You're like, I don't know, you know? I'm going to see, I'm going to ask people if they'll po people are going to put together programs. I know this because I like the, I don't want, it's not simple, but I like the, how it's becoming more like in tune with the weights. And I'm going to see if people will post what they come up with in the discord. And I'm going to kind of totally. look back at what I had done and try to get something put together. And then we can pick that apart in the discord. And uh, yeah, yeah I'm curious there. where that goes. I, uh, I do need to send you just like a, like some like a sample so at least you and i can get on the same page because i think yeah. a lot of the questions you have like give me a couple hours i'll, I'll email you something dude no rush i won't post this probably till next week and then we have plenty of time we're really? Ooh, yeah. i have i got one more thing to hit actually yeah uh, and this is always super important to me because this is the number one thing that endurance athletes like when they come in and do consultations this is the biggest thing um is hypertrophy um, and this is even a talk like in the discord where everyone comes in and says, Hey man, I know I need to lift weights, but like, I don't want to get too swole, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I understand like why this is a concern, right? Because, um, like it's an endurance sport, you know what I mean? And, um, and especially like me, like, I'm not like super jacked, but like, I used to be like 240 when I was competing in powerlifting. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I don't have a lot of clout with the, you know, guy who's coming in trying to PR his half marathon. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, th the thing is, it's basically like, it shouldn't really be a concern necessarily. I'm not saying that everyone should get jacked, but more like you can't. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have to lift a lot to get jacked, right? Like I had a guy tell me, he was like, dude, I was so jacked. I can't do any bench presses. because I'm going to get like jacked again. I'm like, dude, it's not, we're not lifting that much. Like you could bench if you want. Like, no, nah. and I am going to do the bench this year because I've ignored the push horizontally for what reason? Yeah. No good one, except for the yeah. bench is usually the most crowded. <laughs> totally. oh, oh. So I might just do push ups. I'm so like, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I think you can do, you can do any sort of horizontal pushing. You could do push-ups. you could do dips, you could dumbbell bench, you know, um, there's, there's so many things to train. And especially for something like the, the upper body strength, it's just, um, I see it as a component of, of core strength and core stability. Right. Cause at the end of the day, like, you know, we think about core as like, I, you know, I, I felt my abs working. Right. But you're essentially linking your, your upper body mechanics to your lower body mechanics. So I think grabbing the handlebars, you know, um it blows my mind when people just, are like i don't need to lift it and i'm like dude have you ever done like a two and a half minute hill climb and just smashed it your arms are definitely work like you want strong oh, arms my shoulders feel terrible at the oh end. dude it that was i went super deep the other day and on this kom and it was like that was a prescription from my coach like two, two to three maximal hill offers like all in and by the end, I stopped and I was like, oh, my arms just were like, I felt yeah. it. Yeah. Because when your legs get tired, you just start, you just start leaning on the hoods. Pushing. Know? It was just like, yeah, I was, but dude, have you ever used Lactigo before? No, I hear you talk about it all the time. I'm going to send, really I'm gonna send you some. When you email me your info, I'm, I won't put that in, but send me your address. And I'm going to send you some. Um, it's ridiculous. And they, one of the things <laughs> is like a half body test. And yeah. the funny thing was, I kid you not. So I will do when I have a hard day, like full maximal or anything like VO two max, I do the entire body because the upper body, you create lactate there too. Sure. And 
kids you not, I had, this was probably two months ago. I didn't do like the lower part of my arms because I was putting on uh, suntan lotion also. Yeah. And I was out there cranking and literally my forearms were like on fire. And I'm like, <laughs> this is insane. Like it's, so I've noticed it for lifting um, that, especially the recovery aspect, like doms and just afterwards, yeah. I, it's mostly like the carno scene. I felt like I was able to, I was lifting way too heavy. And I mean, I was hitting numbers that I'd never hit before that I was like, man, this stuff cool. is like, you just don't feel any burn. And well, I know, I know baking soda is like, um, like digesting it orally is like a super effective supplement. It's just like your gut can't handle it. Like I know people in TTs, they're like drinking baking soda, like 20 minutes out on the trainer. And then some of them will just like, just so like the, toss yeah. it. You know? Well, so the biggest difference is that's trying to basically soak up the hydrogen ions once they're in your bloodstream, whereas carnosine will do it intracellularly. So before it gets in your blood. So it's, uh, it's a game changer. Um, okay. So there, uh, I forget where it was. It was, um, it was some podcast, but it was the, um, some like ex NFL player. I think he's like one of the biz business guys for amp human. One of the other, uh, okay. I forget what it was, but he was talking about the research they were doing. And he was, he was basically like, he's like, we don't have a perfect mechanism yet. He's like, but it freaking works. <laughs> Their stuff is interesting. It, it it works sometimes. I had tried it. Um, I've probably went through maybe like three bottles of AMP. And there were days where I was like, I think this works. And there were other days where I was like, that didn't work. And it was super depressing. The problem is it's so messy. It's like rubbing baking soda on your legs in a gunk. And so it picks <laughs> up all the road grime. You could never yeah. use, use that for recovery. This stuff is in a gel. So it just dries within probably two minutes, I'd say. Gotcha. So it's just um, like sunscreen, basically. Yeah, it's like putting on well, sunscreen's like thicker. This is like it's like a gel. It's like I'll send you some. Yeah. Wow. Um man, any closing thoughts? This was fantastic. And I'm actually pumped now that we're doing the Discord because we'll have really good follow-up. And uh it, don't feel bum there will probably be messages for you. <laughs> it's okay. Take them with time. I mean, dude, it's literally my job. And like I was saying in the uh in that email, it's like um for me, like I, I have a good, uh, like my work stuff is good. Right. I was like, but I'm always trying to work with more athletes mm, because mm -hmm. like, um, I mean, no, no shade to anyone who's just trying to get better. You know what I mean? But yeah. like, for me, it's so much more satisfying to help an athlete reach a performance goal. Mm. And in order to do that, I'm realizing it's like, you need to cast like a really, really, really wide net to get mm -hmm. your name out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you also got to do work for free, you know? Yeah. um you gotta like put stuff out there and just like be available you know and like totally. that's a part of like that needs to be a part of like your own job you know i think from any business i've ever been in is like the work that i've done for free has been the most foundational of even uh like when i was selling medical devices i would go be in the operating room not selling anything just trying to learn from a surgeon it would right. piss off the other reps because they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, so-and-so said I could come watch. I just want to learn his technique. And they're like, dude, get out of here. This is like my account. I'm like, <laughs> we'll see about that. Like, sorry, I'm just hustling. Just hustling, man. And so that's the thing. I think, you know, it's, yeah, put out, put out the best information. Um, and, you know, that's exactly like the reason I'm talking to you. And that was my uh, comment in the Discord. I was like, so wait, when are we going to the gym together? You can tell me <laughs> everything. There's no way that in the conversations or the stuff that you could put out, I would be able to get the benefit of working with you directly. Like this is just impossible. And it's but I'm also obsessed with coaches in like every aspect of life. Cause anytime I've ever invested money in someone helping me, it is, I've gotten so much more out of it. And yeah. What's your, uh, well, what's your gym plan for your off season? Dude, that's why I'm putting this program together so we yeah. can, I'm not, so I need to throw some shit at you then. <laughs> throw it at me for sure. And I'm, I, dude, I would follow anything because GZCLP worked for me, except for my issues were I was lifting way too much. I was lifting tens all the time and it really messed me up. Um, I was also like slowly overtraining myself. Yeah. And totally. so 
I stopped, I had an issue with my QL that stemmed from this. And so I stopped lifting the gym a couple months ago, maybe three months ago now. It's been a while. And then I was worried about starting back up with this. Like I was, it was a slow rehab. And then with racing, I was still riding well. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to wait till after the last race and then start doing something. I think that's, that's smart though, because like in, in season, even if like, even for me, it's like, like, I think everyone should lift all the time, you know, but it's mm-hmm. like in season, not the time to do it because no lifting in season or some, it wouldn't be the time to introduce it. Yeah. Okay. It wouldn't be so, the time to introduce it. So I was like, Maybe I'm going to skip someone like yourself. That's, that's done some lifting and you, you know, your way around the gym and you know what you need to get out of it. Like adding that, adding that stress in there. would be like, well, I tried and I went, I did some like home stuff with the kettlebell. I was like just tore up for like two and a half days i was like i can't this is not the time i'm just yeah i'm not lifting enough to get any benefit for the upcoming races so my plan was to go and start doing like some lower weight higher rep stuff just to get the movements back in but i would be open to being a guinea pig you should be a guinea pig um so like what kind of what kind of what kind of lifts were you doing you said you, you said you're into doing trap bar i was doing Trap bar and squat. Trap and bar, deadlift. Let me actually see if I can pull this up real quick. Uh, lifting. Okay. I'm just now bringing GZCLP up. I think I looked at it once, like mm-hmm. maybe like six months ago when you mentioned it on a podcast. Mm-hmm. I hadn't heard of it before. So I was where, doing like... Where did you guys find it? Patrick's brother was into it or found it or something. Mm-hmm. It's a huge Reddit community. And so I see my squat day was squat, then bent over. So squat was five by three. Um, bent over row was three by eight. I did then uh, like a traditional deadlift, lightweight, lap pull down, some core and push ups. And then on my deadlift day, I do deadlift heavy and yeah. then overhead press, uh, like a goblet squat or just like a light squat uh core lap pull down different uh wide or narrow i'd switch it up and a lateral raise and then the third one so i just had three different days um my overhead press was overhead press heavy deadlift high pull heavy hold kettlebell swings and push-ups and then if you really do gzclp the fourth day is bench so those four big lifts, you do each one has a heavy day and then each one those rotate through as a secondary day. And then you pick like three to five tertiary lifts. Gotcha. I got the, uh, I got the little infograph up. Yeah. Sweet. And then I, mean, I was doing, I think it's like a totally fine, uh, it's a totally fine exercise selection. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, I admit that it's like definitely a bias on my part, but I think like doing regular ass squats and deadlifts with the bar is like, super fun and like a cost effective way of, uh, I guess more of like a time effective way of getting some good work in, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I just think there can be, be some tweaks basically. And uh, I like lunges cause those just feel like they're working a lot of stuff. Lunges are dope. Um, yeah, I love lunges. Uh, you ever done split squats? No. Like a rear foot elevated split squat. So I'm doing that. So I had to do that for PT. That like hurts the top of my foot, the rear foot. Like I did it without a shoe on in like in the living room on like an ottoman. I was like, this doesn't feel good. And then I tried it like with a sneaker on outside. And I was like, what, what's wrong with my foot? Like it just, is it like crampy or is it like a, it's like diggy, like like a smashy kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, It's like kind of smash. I don't know. I tried again. Maybe I need to watch another video on YouTube, but I do them on just like a regular bench press bench. Yeah. Okay. Something that's kind of padded um i'm I think hoping to try that those are pretty um the way you're putting force into the ground it's like pretty pedal stroke specific um that range of motion will be just like a little bit longer than one crank rotation um so i think sprinkling those in is super rad and it's just like a good it's good uh it's challenging balance wise too mm-hmm. um, and people kind of like poo poo um, step ups a little bit step ups are bomb okay Dude, um, put tell me what to do. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I got you. I'll be emailing you. The uh yeah, step ups are bomb because it's also like uh 
you know, really, it's just a slightly different plane than, than lunges, right? Because okay. you're moving, moving vertically. Okay. Um, and, but it's still, it's that same sort of just like, you know, kind of quad and glute dominant, like pedal stroke, you know? Have we glutes? We found that out through, um, when I had this QL issue, doing like single leg glute bridges and fire hydrants. And I was like dying. And the guy's like, yeah, dude, your glutes are. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, I try not to use like balance too much with cyclists because it's kind of like, it's, it's specific, right. You know, you're spending 20 hours uh, like this, you know, Mm -hmm. um, but like, you know, we worry a lot about like ancillary muscles with cycling, but it's like, dude, 85% of cycling is your freaking quads. You know what I mean? And so if you're just hammering for 20 hours a week, your quads are going to be super strong. Right. And you're never going to be training any sort of like, cause even when you use your glutes, right. Your, your back is still here. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe if you're sprinting, you're like here, <laughs> mm-hmm. but like you're never training any like terminal glute, uh, ex- terminal hip extension. Right. Okay. So like, even when you're stepping down, like your leg is here when it's straight down. Right but that's different than like if you're standing up and you're, you're, you're here. Right. So terminal. Mm-hmm. Extension. So the, the idea that you would have like really good terminal extension doing like a single leg glute bridge would be like, well, yeah, you don't, you yeah. don't train yeah. <laughs> all of your extensions in that partial range of motion. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, you so can- that goes to my first question though, then shouldn't I train some stuff more as a sh- strong human? Like, do the things that I'm not getting on the bike. Like, don't I need to do that? Like non bikey stuff? Maybe a little bit. Um, I would just, I think just like a really general, like balance strength program and just getting stronger at compound lifts will get you there. You know, like, um, you're always going to be a little unbalanced because, you know, you're trying to win big ass bike races, you know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Nothing about like, you know, like, you know, pushing your threshold, like farther into the five something Watts per kilo is balanced, you know what I mean? Right. So I, I think I try to, I try to remove that narrative as much as possible because it's, it brings up a lot of concern for people, but the good thing is that like, we're adaptable, right. You know, Mm -hmm. if if we were like, you know, farming rice in Southeast Asia, our entire lives being bent over, we wouldn't have back pain for that because we did it our whole lives, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so like tissues are adaptable, humans are adaptable and it's, and it's, it's not really about this sort of like perfect balance. It's about, um, you know, graded exposure to certain stimuluses and then making sure that that exposure is correct is kind of what we're looking for. Okay. Uh, Because assessing balance is always really poor, right? How do we do that? At the end of the day, there's some arbitrary thing where someone says, aha, here is balanced, you know, and it's, it's different, you know? So, so yeah, I think as you're just staying general, you're good to go, you know? All right, dude, general me up. I'm ready. (laughs) Funny. My dog was just like, wait, what, what? (laughs) You're ready to get into the program. You're going to get Jack this year. We had, you had two more questions that I wanted to answer for you though. Yeah, sure. You had a plyos question. I did. Do we need, I see it. Do you know what I should do is I shouldn't, I assume that people want to do this in an hour. And so I was okay. like, dude, we don't have time for the plow cool. question. Do do we need to do plow? Uh, I don't think so. Good. Um, I don't like doing it. <laughs> uh, dude. Yeah. I've, I've held a time right now. So if you have any other questions that like, that you want to ask, you can, you can fire a man. Um, plyo yeah. people make the claim, you know, you have to take the strength and turn it into speed, but I'm like, it's not really the same as you're doing on the bike. Like just go do some sprints. That's the speed. Like that's the connection. Right. Or thing. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Plyo, I, I feel think- like it's too aerobic. We're getting enough aerobic work. It's like, you're just getting, it's the fatigue. Yeah. What do you call it? fatigue management? You're just getting really, people get smoked sometimes from the plyo stuff because it's just like, yeah. It's intense. Well, so when you say plyos, what what kind of what's the what would be box like box jumps, like, medicine ball throws? Like, yeah, how many how many reps though? Maybe like 10, 20. Ooh, see that would be aerobic, right? Because yeah. then you're looking at that, and that's like doing twenty box jumps. That might take you a minute. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's like a hard like you know. I mean, that still might be like anaerobic, but like you're hitting that 45, 30 second mark where your aerobic systems you know produce most of the power there. You know? Yeah. Especially if you're tired, you're not like cranking them out 
Dude, totally. Um, I'd be like calling a, like a 30 second effort, like a sprint, like that's not a sprint. That's aerobic, you know, like, like it might be like FRC or something, but you know what I mean? Like your lungs are telling you otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um, so with, uh, I would do plyos. They'd be mandatory for runners. Okay. Why is Uh, that? Because runners have a, uh, a different set of concerns because they have to deal with the landing phase of each step cyclists. We're just, there's no landing phase. We're just, we're just cranking, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the things when you train plyos, it's you're training that force production, but you're also training absorbing force. Right. So um, that's a big thing mm. for like uh, ACL stuff, knee stuff is um, and beginners and youth athletes. It's like, we need to teach people how to land and we need to teach people how to change direction, you know? Mm-hmm. It's a bunch of stuff for field athletes that you, we just don't have to deal with cyclists because in some ways training cyclists is even easier, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think you don't need it because you can get it on the bike, like go do like five or six, you know, max efforts, like when you're fresh, like once a week in season, if you want to, and that's probably fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and if people wanted to do it, I would actually just include it in someone's warm up, Right. Mm. So hmm. you can, so let's say you start, let's say you're squatting, you're going to do like empty bar, you know, maybe 95, 135 in between your empty bar and light work sets. Um, and we did this all the time with university athletes because we're having to train them in a, in a circuit super fast, basically. Mm-hmm. But that, Hey, you have a partner on the rack. Well, one person's doing their warm up sets. Other person's doing three, like sets of three box jumps. So for plyos, if you actually are working on force production, um, it needs to be full rest. Um, it needs to be jumping as hard as you can. Um, and it super fresh and that's it, you know? And so if you do box jumps correctly, it's kind of just like, I'm not even sure that did anything. You know what I mean? That's so it's like, I'm thinking through this again, just like cycling. I wouldn't tell somebody to go do a 10 second max sprint and then wait 20 seconds to do it again. I'd be like, yeah, wait, you're doing <laughs> wait like, yeah, wait like eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I would, okay. I would, I would train it like that. Um, I don't think it's super important. So it's the first thing I would just throw away. But mm. um, I think in season, especially if someone's who's like, like, Hey man, I'm a crit racer and I need to be super fast. And if I do some box jumps, it's going to increase my, maybe not even my sprint, but it might increase their self-efficacy and their ability to sprint because they know they're training that. I think that would be a reason to do it. You know, um, if it can help someone's own like internal narrative. Yeah. Um, but it can also just help you get warmed up, you know, like apply some fat, apply some force, you know, I like it, but you don't need them. It's like, no, good. Not doing them. (laughs) <laughs> don't, what, don't. what was the other question that you had on the list I, was <sighs> I think that was kind of it okay i just wanted to hit the hypertrophy stuff i think i said that in the discord too um, mm-hmm. um you did i laughed at that just because it's like you know what i mean like my parents aren't super jacked and you know i you know you need to be in a caloric surplus like most cyclists it's like you know, if you gain like two kilos in the off season, you're not really on that big of a caloric surplus. You probably just have more glycogen and water, mm-hmm. you know, like, um, it's really hard. Like I've spent like 10 years trying to get as jacked as possible. And after I lost all my powerlifting weight, I'm like 12 pounds heavier than I was in high school. You know what I mean? Like, and I took my squat from like 150 pounds to like 620. you know what I mean? And that equaled, 20 pounds of actual muscle like IRL, you know? Yeah. And so it's like the idea that someone can do a tiny bit of gym work, like once a week, like, Hey, I did dumbbell bench twice a week. You know, my frontal area is going to be massive. I'm never going to win a cat four race. You know, it's like, I don't know, dude. Like, I think you're cool. You know? Yeah. <laughs> You'll be all right. oh, I love that, Matt. You'll be all right. Dude, this is awesome. Thank you so much for taking yeah, the time man. to do this. I love yeah. it. My pleasure. Um, I, look, I look forward to seeing the email. I'll get your uh, contact info. We'll throw that in the uh, show notes. People can reach out to you about getting more serious about the lifting. And we'll talk soon uh, in the Discord. Sounds good. All Thanks. right, man. Have a you great too. afternoon. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah.